Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Besley, and I'm the director of the Suntory Toyota International Centers for Economics and Related Disciplines at the LSE. I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's Michio Morishima Lecture. This is a major event in the life of Stickard and honors our founder, Michio Morishima, who is a distinguished mathematical economist and latterly a public intellectual who commented extensively on Japanese culture and the economy. Um, this afternoon's speaker fits perfectly well with the ambitions of the lecture, which is to invite a distinguished academic whose work has reached out beyond academia. So I'm delighted in that context to introduce Glenn Lowry, who I first met in 1989, uh, still during impressionable years. And what I learned from him, I continue to carry uh, with me today. I was immediately in awe of his intellect uh, and knew him as a mathematical powerhouse. Um, his important contributions to economic theory uh, include a classic paper on intergenerational equity uh, written as part of his PhD thesis. And he and I worked together and wrote two papers, and we were re reminiscing yesterday, as only the nerdiest of economists do, on the challenge that we faced in one of the technical arguments uh, due to working in an infinite dimensional space. And it was Glenn who, in, who had an incredibly elegant argument that uh, we were discussing that appears in one of our papers. Uh, Glenn subsequently wrote a classic paper that some of you will know on the economics of affirmative action with my good friend Steve Cote. Uh, and not to be neglected is Glenn's considerable uh, academic achievements uh, include the fact that he was one of the first people uh, to coin the term social capital in his PhD thesis in 1976, something subsequently acknowledged by people like James Coleman uh, who, who, who suddenly developed the idea conjointly. Glenn is both a deep and elegant thinker. He brings clarity to murky topics, and although many of the topics are political, he cannot be categorized by conventional labels. Uh, I'm tempted to say that, above all, Glenn brings an economic theorist's sense of order and clarity to everything that he does, even when wearing the mantle of the public intellectual, and he's an extremely influential public intellectual, and many of you will know him through that. Um, it's been my ambition to bring Glenn uh, to the LSE for some time, and I'm delighted that at last um, I can welcome him here. Um, it's the first Mor Morishima lecture in uh, two years in person, um, so it's great to be back here with Glenn, and I'm looking forward, as I'm sure all of you, to what Glenn uh, has to say. He'll speak for uh, about an hour, and then we'll have questions and discussion. So over to you, Glenn, and welcome. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you, Tim, for that warm uh, introduction. Thank you, it's a pleasure and honor uh, to be here giving this lecture. I have a text that I think I'll uh, adhere to so that I don't say anything out of turn. A specter haunts the domestic political scene in America today. It is the specter of racial conflict growing out of the anger and alienation of many black Americans. Our pundits tell us that we are living in a period of racial reckoning in America. Racial disputes suffuses our public life from school committee elections to national political contests. This estrangement of black intellectuals, politicians, journalists, and activists derives in large part from the persistent disadvantage of blacks across so many fronts in our economic and social life. The reality here is too familiar, too widely known to require elaborate recitation. Whether considering health or wealth, income or education, imprisonment or criminal victimization, the disadvantaged status of us African Americans who descend from slaves here in the third decade of the 21st century, more than 150 years after official emancipation of enslaved Africans is palpable. What are we to make of this? That question has bedeviled me for decades, indeed ever since I began graduate studies in economics at MIT a half century ago. So it is with heavy heart that I stand before you today, a black American 
economist in this era of racial discontent in my country, an Ivy League professor and a descendant of slaves, a beneficiary of the Civil Rights Revolution now over two generations in the past, which has made possible for me a life that my ancestors could only have dreamed of. More than that, I am a patriot who loves his country. I consider myself to be a man of the West who has inherited its great traditions. As such, I feel compelled to represent the interests of my people here and now. However, that reference is not unambiguous, invoking, as it does, both communal and civic antecedents. For me, ultimately, the civic priorities must be prior to the communal ones. But those communal ties, that call of the tribe, if you will, remain strong. Just what, I must ask, is a self-respecting black American to do in the face of such persisting racial inequality? And so, to set the stage for what is to come, I ask you to consider an imaginary dialogue between two black American social scientists, one, an e economic theorist of neoliberal orientation, rather like me, and the other, an ethnographic sociologist with radical left political leanings, very unlike me. It goes as follows. The Economist, chanting, but otherwise quite still, Relations before transactions. Relations before transactions. Relations before transactions. Relations before transactions. The sociologist enters with a start. What's wrong, my friend? Why are you saying that? You must be the culprit who pilfered my copy of Bordeaux last week. The economist. No, I am not. And who is Bordeaux anyway? I'll bet he's one of those incomprehensible French theorist you're always fawning over. It's my mantra. I'm meditating. Very calming. You should try it sometime. The sociologist ignoring the dig. I meditate all the time, man. I'm the one who belongs to a profession fraught with anxiety. But what's your excuse? The economist. Well, I've been having a recurrent nightmare of late. I wanted to stop. My shrink thinks Meditation could help. Who's your shrink? This brother was my roommate at Swarthmore. Brilliant dude. Works a lot with gunshot victims, city types involved in gangs and the drug trade and so on. He thinks they're making passive suicide attempts. He writes books on hopelessness, self-loathing, falling into an existential abyss. He cites Freud and Nietzsche and Dessad. Strange guy, but brilliant. He gave me the mantra, probably it would help said I should repeat it slowly while sitting very still and taking deep breaths. The sociologist. Perhaps, but remember what I told you about those pizzas? Not such a good idea after midnight. And did you say decide? Anyway, tell me, what's the The economist. Oh, it's awful. I'm back in grad school. I'm sitting in my usual place right in the front of the class. The professor poses what he says is an important question and invites one of us up to the board to work out an answer. I get there first and proceed to fill the board with equations, and finally, I arrive at what must be the solution. My derivation is far too elegant not to be true. I turn to explain myself to the rest of the class, and just then I realize I've forgotten the original question. I rack my very large brain, but for the life of me, I can't recall it. The class begins to snicker. They're a ruthless bunch when they smell blood. The guffaws and catcalls grow louder. It's humiliating, just humiliating. The economist begins to tremble uncontrollably. Sociologist comforting his friend. Yeah, I can see that. It's got to be tough being the smartest person in the room without a clue as to what's the point. You ought to stick with that shrink, though. Dreams can be very revealing, you know. But I'm not sure I get the mantra. And what was the professor's question anyway? The economist. He had asked us to explain how durable racial inequality in the United States can be squared with the premises of modern economic theory without making any assumption of innate 
racial inferiority and without postulating any unexplained preferences for own group associations. The sociologists. That's a damn good question. And a tough one, too. You're telling me you ran to the board to take that one on? Brave man. Fools jump in where angels fear to tread. The economist. Well, to be honest, in the dream, I always start to the board before he finishes posing the question. Happens the same way every time. I can't stop myself. And the trembling returns. The sociologist, in a bright tone, hoping to shift to a happier subject. So what was your elegant solution? And the economist, oh, I'd love to tell you, but you'd never understand the math. <laughs> At this, the sociologist takes offense and storms off angrily with the economist yelling after him. Besides, I'm not sure I believe it anymore myself. Anyway, my shrink gave me this mantra, and it seems to be helping. And so he returns to his chanting, relations before transactions, relations before transactions, relations before transactions. Thus ends my imaginary dialogue. As you will see, it captures the central theme of this presentation. And now on to the lecture proper. Why, I ask, the success of the civil rights movement notwithstanding has the unequal economic status of Americans persisted into the 21st century. Clear thinking about this difficult problem requires that we distinguish between the role played by anti-black discrimination, past and present, and the role of behavior patterns to be found among some blacks. This, I admit, is a very sensitive issue rather starkly. I wish to suggest that we chart a middle course acknowledging anti-black biases and insisting they be remedied where possible, but also urging that we identify and seek to reverse the behavioral patterns that are preventing some people from seizing newly opened opportunities. Some of this thinking was summed up in my monograph, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, initially published by Harvard Press in 20 years ago. That book sketched a theory of race applicable to the social and historical circumstances of the United States. It speculated about why racial inequalities persist, advancing a conceptual framework for thinking about social justice in matters of race. It was one part social science, one part social criticism, and one part social philosophy, themes that were pursued in successive chapters titled racial stereotypes, racial stigma, and racial justice, deriving from a series of lectures I had given at Harvard's Du Bois Institute. I want to establish a foundation for what is to come by briefly reviewing some of those ideas because, as is strenuously argued by the UCLA sociologist Rogers Brubaker in his fine book, Ethnicity Without Groups, which I much admire, one ought never to invoke racial aggregates as subjects of social analysis unreflectively. So please bear with me. I assure you the relevance of this conceptual excursion will be clear soon enough. A theoretical discussion of this kind properly starts with an account of the phenomenon of race itself. Why do people take note of and assign significance to the skin color, hair texture, and bone structure of other human beings? How have the superficial markings on human bodies taken on social significance such that people routinely partition the field of human subjects whom they encounter into groups? with this sorting convention based on these subjects possessing some observable bodily needs. This is a universal feature of human societies, but why should that be so? I proposed in that book, acknowledging in advance there was no great originality in this, to conceive of race as a social construct, a conventional, not a natural category. For me, the term race refers to indelible and heritable marks on human bodies of no intrinsic significance in themselves, which nevertheless have through time come to be invested with social expectations that are more or less reasonable and with social meanings that are more or less durable. When talking about race in America or anywhere else for that matter, we are dealing with two processes, categorization and signification. 
categorization entails sorting people into cognitively manageable subsets based on bodily marks and differentiating one's dealings with such persons accordingly. It is a cognitive act, an effort to comprehend the social world around us. By contrast, signification is an interpretative act, associating certain connotations or social meanings with those categories. So, both informational and symbolic issues are at play, or as I like to put it, when we speak of race, what we're really talking about is embodied social signification. This is the constructivist spirit that I employed in realizing the negative interpretive and symbolic connotations that have always attached to blackness in the United States owing to the history of African slavery. Given this theoretical understanding of race, what then might one say about the causes of persistent racial inequality? Fundamental to my approach in that book was the distinction between racial discrimination and racial stigma. Discrimination is about how black pe people are treated, while stigma is about how we are perceived. I argued that what I called reward bias, that is, different treatment in the marketplace, had become a less significant barrier to the full partition of par participation of black people in American society than is development bias, by which I mean differential access to crucial opportunities for growth. Reward bias focuses on unfavorable treatment of black people in formal transactions, limiting the returns on skills and talents we have uh, acquired, while Development bias focuses on the impediments that block access for black people to those social interactions necessary to acquire skills and to refine talents. My idea was that such interactions are always mediated by informal social networks. Reward bias is rooted in racially discriminatory transactions. Development bias is grounded in racially stigmatized relations. Many of the resources that foster human development only become available to persons as the byproduct of informal, race-influenced social interactions. Put differently, reward bias entails discrimination in contract, whereas development bias entails discrimination in contact. Contract versus contact. Transactions versus relations. Can you see what I'm getting at? Obviously, these two kinds of bias are not mutually exclusive. Acquisition of skills can be blocked by overt acts of discrimination. Moreover, a regime of market discrimination that comes under pressure from the forces of competition may require for its maintenance employing informal instruments of social control. Still, while both kinds of bias promote racial inequality, the distinction is useful. For whereas the moral problem presented by reward bias is straightforward and calls for an uncontroversial remedy via laws against discrimination, development bias presents a subtle, more insidious ethical challenge, one that may be difficult to remedy via public policies in any manner likely to garner majoritarian support. Law and policy are readily available for fighting reward bias, but less so for countering development bias. This is because citizens who find the transactional discrimination associated with reward bias to be noxious may be more accepting of the relational discrimination underlying development bias. Race preference in the choice of one's personal associations may seem to be less problematic racial preference in the choice of one's trading partners. So perhaps now one can see what the economist Shrink was getting at in that opening dialogue with his mantra, relations before transactions. He was pointing toward the idea that the persisting subordinate position of blacks in the economy is thought of as deriving from our stigmatized status in the society and not the other way around. He was hinting that a focus on racial discrimination and economic transactions does not cut, deep, cut deeply enough. One must also consider the consequences of the racially stigmatized social relations that inhibit blacks' access 
for those networks of affiliation where developmental resources are most readily appropriated. On this view, the ultimate source of persisting inequality is not a racially hostile marketplace or an administrative state, as had been the case in the past. Rather, the mantra's claim is that today's problem derives mainly from a race-tinged psychology of perception and valuation, a way of seeing and relating to black people that withholds from them a presumption of equal human worth. A racial group's stigmatized status in the imagination and in its own self-understanding may be rationalized and socially reproduced due to the group's subordinate position within the economic order, order thereby creating a vicious circle. Here then we have a world where racial dignity Racial subordination, racial dishonor, racial pride and shame resonate powerfully. Such has been my world, which may help you to understand why I identify so closely with that fictional black economist in the opening dialogue. I have done so for nearly half a century. 26 years before the publication of The Anatomy of Racial Inequality in my doctoral dissertation written at MIT under the inspiring supervision of Robert Solo, I had the good fortune to coin the term social capital. To my everlasting benefit, the great sociologist James Coleman in his 1990 treatise Foundations of Social Theory credited me, along with Jane Jacobs, as having been an originator of this concept. What is more, distinguished political scientist Putnam cited me to the same effect in his 1992 study, Making Democracy Work. Not bad. I'll take it. <laughs> As it happens, I first used this concept in an analysis of persistent racial inequality in America. By discussing how I came to coin the term social capital, I can further illuminate the contrast I'm drawing between informal social relations and formal economic transactions, between reward and development bias as mechanisms perpetuating the subordinate economic position of black people in America. Thinking as an economist, I wanted to contrast my concept, social capital, with the more familiar idea of human capital. As you know, human capital theory attempts to explain variations in the earnings capacities of persons by analogy with the well-developed theory of investment in economics, assuming rational by forward-looking individuals, analyzing investment decisions in light of an agent's discount rate, their anticipated returns, and the available alternative uses for their time. Human capital theory imports into the study of human inequality the intellectual framework well-developed within economics to explain investment by firms, a framework that focuses on the analysis of formal economic transactions. Put simply, my point in 1976 was that associating business with human investments is merely an analogy, not an identity, particularly if one seeks to explain persistent racial disparities. I argued that important things were overlooked in the human capital approach, things having to do with informal social relations. I emphasized two central aspects of this incompleteness, and this forms the basis of my argument for placing relations before transactions. First, I observe that human development is socially situated and mediated. That is, the development of human beings occurs inside of social institutions. It takes place as between people. It's dialogic. It's context is human interaction. Families, peer groups, the school, the neighborhood, communities. These institutions of human association are where development occurs. As such, many of the resources that are essential to human development, the attention that a parent gives to her child, for example, are not alienable. Developmental resources, for the most part, are not commodities. Human development is in the main not up for sale. Instead, structured connections between individuals create the context within which the mental resources come to be allocated to individual persons. Opportunity travels along the synapses of such networks. The resulting allocation of resources may not be efficient. 
development of human beings is in this respect fundamentally different from corporate investment. And so it may not be a good idea to reason as if that were not so. This was my main point in 1976. The family is one such institution, a fundamental observation since human development begins before birth. Decisions a mother makes about how closely to her health and nutrition during pregnancy, for example, will alter the development of her fetus. This and a myriad other things that I could name all come together to shape the experience of a newly born infant who will mature one day to become a human being about whom it will be said that he or she has this or that productivity as reflected in their wages or their scores manifest on some cognitive examination. Well, I was arguing in 1976 that they are not machines and their productivities, that is to say, their behavioral and cognitive capacities bearing on their social and economic functioning. These things are not merely the result of a mechanical infusion of material resources. Instead, these capacities are the byproducts of social processes mediated by human affiliation and connectivity. This is the key for understanding persistent racial disparities. My second observation was that, as mentioned previously, what we're talking about when we talk about race is mainly a social and only indirectly a biological phenomenon. The persistence across generations of racial differentiation between large groups of people in an open society where individuals live in proximity to one another provides irrefutable indirect evidence of a profound separation between the racially defined networks of social affiliation in that society. Put simply, there would be no races in the steady state of any dynamic social system unless, on a daily basis and in regard to their most intimate affairs, people paid assiduous attention to the boundaries separating themselves from racially distinct others. Over time, race would cease to exist unless people chose to act in a manner so as to reproduce the variety of phenotypic expression that constitutes the substance of racial distinction. Race is not something given in nature. Rather, it is actually produced. It's an equilibrium outcome. It's something we are making. It's endogenous. Thus, if the goal is to understand durable racial inequality, we will need to attend in some detail to the processes that cause race to persist as a life in the society under study. For such processes almost certainly will not be unrelated to the allocation via a variety of social interactions and networks of the human developmental resources in that society. Here then is my second point in a nutshell. The creation and reproduction of race as a feature of society rests upon a set of beliefs and conceptions about identity held by people in that society, beliefs about who they are, about the legitimacy of conducting intimate relations with racially distinct others. And here I do not only mean sexual relations, though I do mean that too. The contrast I drew between human and social capital all those years ago was based on the conviction that beliefs of this kind will affect the access various persons enjoy to those informal resources that individuals need to develop their human potential. Social capital, for me, was therefore a critical feature in the creation of what we economists routinely refer to as human capital. A theory of racial inequality would be incomplete if it failed to consider interactions between the reproduction of racial difference in those societies on the one hand and the processes facilitating human development on the other. Based on these connections between race and development, I concluded that durable racial inequality is ultimately a cultural phenomenon, implicating not simply transfers of wealth, but more fundamentally the decisions we make daily about with whom to associate and to identify. These conceptions about identity are embraced by people of all races. What I called social capital in my dissertation more than 45 years ago is, on this view, a critical prerequisite for creating what economists call human capital and, in turn, as we know, 
human capital the experiences skills training education and acquired social aptitudes which constitute and reflect a person's development determines an individual's power and thus his ability to generate and to accumulate wealth to summarize racial inequality persists because the social fact of racial identity limits access to developmental resources and the acquisition of human capital financial disparities like the much touted racial wealth are to be expected under such circumstances this is why I have always been dissatisfied with an economic approach to understanding racial discrimination in America where the social meaning of race plays no operational role in the theory. That is massively a historical. Of course, as a theoretical exercise, one can elaborate a price theory for markets where traders are averse to doing business with some group marked by an X, and we don't inquire about what X signifies of the sort that the great Gary Becker developed in his classic work from the 1950s. I'm not against that program. I'm merely saying that to do so would leave the analysis incomplete. When I first read that book, The Economics of Discrimination, I was thinking from the south side of Chicago in 1969, this is America. A neighborhood across town had just been burned to the ground. There had once been an institution called slavery, et cetera. In the America of my youth, I thought blackness was certainly not merely a cipher, not simply an X, not merely a mark. It meant and means something. And those distorted meanings must have some part in the perpetuation of racial disparities. Actually, what blackness means in America often has negative connotations. It often means uncivil and backward and licentious. Its aura is compromised, a dark exotic and otherness has hovered around the meaning of blackness. Negative connotations have developed over generations in, this, in my country, I thought, as I sat in a library carol in 1969 reading Gary Becker's 1957 book. What I'm talking about here in a word is racial stigma. Even in 1969, I had the vague sense that Becker's story was incomplete, that this incompleteness was stark and graphic when one considers the question of race in America, and that the context for human development and human investment was racially tinged and unequal because structures of social connectedness were and are racially disparate. I could see even then that race, that is blackness, was not an arbitrary mark. Rather, this symbol was and is laden with historical meanings particular to American society, meanings that, as history would have it, carry a stigmatizing, negative, degrading, and subordinating connotation. This point is fundamental for me. Because without this insight, one may do something that, though not logical, is nevertheless an error one may say, as many more or less conservative commentators have in fact said, look, look at the recent immigrants from Asia and even from Latin America. They too have been victims in various ways and yet they have advanced in our society, even as you blacks of inner city Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Oakland, et cetera, et cetera, continue to lag. What's wrong with you people? Without realizing that bodily marks signify things, negative things, otherness things, influencing the opportunity for bearing those marks to develop their human capacities, without seeing this, one may attribute the backwardness of these people who have been stigmatized to their essence. One will say, in effect, it must be something about those people, not about us, that causes them to be so backward choose social and political and moral responsibility for their plight and conclude that their failure to develop either reflects the absence of the potential to develop in the first place, and we have books on the shelf making that argument, or one will decide upon this narrative. Their failure is due to their cultural depravity, which sadly, though inevitably, what can we do, causes them to lag behind. By contrast, putting relations before transactions. When trying to account for persistent racial disparity in the United States, leads 
to this counter narrative. Of course, there may be some things that are backward about their culture. The jails are full of blacks in the United States, and they are not political prisoners. Two of every three black newborns in America has a mother with no husband. And that can't possibly be inconsequential for social outcomes affecting those children, et cetera. So I will concede that there's some stuff on the supply side here. There's something, if you must, if you must, that is, as we economists like to say, in their utility functions. But I would ask, how did they get there? Is declaring that they possess certain values, attitudes, and beliefs simply a statement about them? Or when we understand that the way people come to value things is itself created via interactions in society, might it not also be a statement about us? My concern here is to warn against a mistake that one can make, a mistake in the analysis of society about the extent to which racial inequality reflects cultural differences between insular groups of people rather than it being the product of a system of social interactions in and between groups, interactions that knit us all together in a seamless web. Put directly, to impute a causal role to what one takes to be intrinsic cultural traits of a subordinate racial group while failing to see the system-wide context out of which such dysfunctional cultural patterns have emerged is to make a significant error of social analysis. Allow me now to further illustrate my second point. My first point was that investments are contextualized, and so the social networks within which people are located, the structures of those networks mediating any investment are relevant to a theory of human inequality in a manner that might not be so relevant in a market idealized setting of acquiring physical plant and equipment. That was my first point. My second point is that the marks in question, the symbols signifying racial difference, are created with important connotations that can adversely affect a person's opportunities to develop his or her skills. In this second point, I am stressing that race symbols have meaning. Specifically in the US context, blackness has meanings associated with it that are stigmatized. This stigma inclines people to a presumption against the merit of persons bearing the mark. It causes people to start out doubting the assumption that the stigmatized one is like us. It leads an observer to be reticent to engage intimately with such a person. This social allocation of development, developmental resources on my account is very different from a market allocation of developmental resources. I hold that people don't make social judgments with whom to about with whom to associate by means of straightforward cost calculations. They often act on identity considerations. They ask such questions as, who am I? How then ought I to live? With whom should I associate? And when ought I extend to this other a benefit of the doubt? What is more, I'm generally the second point to an observation about the culture versus structure debate, saying that one makes a cognitive error if one takes racial inequality to be a reflection simply of cultural difference between insular groups when, as a matter of fact, such inequality is the outcome of a system of social interaction that entails all of us together, as I have said, in a seamless web. Consider, therefore, two extended examples which illustrate this point race, marriage, and the family. I mentioned out of wet like birth rates amongst blacks. They're high. This issue actually illuminates how we can take culture as if it were simply there, when it is, in fact, something we produce, all of us. So let's talk about marriage, the family, childbearing, a person looking at gender relations between black people in the United States at divorce rates, out of what, like birth rates, abortion rates, and so forth, might be inclined to comment, ah, just look at how they are living. But I would urge us to consider intermarriage rates between the races in the United States. They are low, higher than they had been, but they remain quite low, though they have recent in, risen in decades. Now, I am not casting aspersions here. It might be that black women are getting propositions from white men all the time and turning them down. I don't know. 
but I do know that in the equilibrium, there's a low rate of cross-boundary mating between these groups, and I strongly suspect that this fact must have implications for human development, for resources available to children, and for the generation and transmission of wealth. Moreover, it must also have implications for dating and mating among African Americans, because blacks are a small minority of a large population, roughly one in so if white men and black women were marrying at higher rates, even only slightly higher, black men and black women would be interacting in a different way. How? I don't know exactly. That would be a study. That's not my point. My point is a higher level insight to it. Observing a social equilibrium in which black and white populations exhibit different out of what like birth rates and on that basis, Imputing the difference to something called black culture reflects a failure to see how the intra-racial marriage market is nested within a larger context where a higher rate of cross-boundary interracial mating could substantially alter the intra-boundary behavior. The outside option, the bargaining problem. I hope it's clear what I'm getting. So what one could take to be culture just might turn out to be structure after all. What was seen to be a characteristic of those people, why don't they marry? Why do they bear their children in such a disorderly manner? Just might turn out to be a question about us, all of us. Why do we avoid intimacy with them? Here's another example. Race and the war on drugs. For my second example, consider the war on drugs in the United States. The fact is that the number of people locked up in prisons and jails in America went from 500,000 in 1980 to 2 million by the year 2000. It has tailed off some since then, but it's still quite high. It quadrupled in 20 years. Blacks are one in eight or, of, or so of Americans, but about one in two prisoners in the United States. There are more black people in prison in America than there are people in prison in some pretty good sized countries like Germany, France, or England. The war on drugs very clearly was a policy choice that had a lot to do with this. Not the only thing for sure, but it had a lot to do with it. It was an expression of public sentiment. Political campaigns were run on the issue. The growth of imprisonment in America has been partly due to explicit efforts to curtail narcotics trafficking. All right, fine. You're against drugs. But you don't have to be Pierre Bourdieu to see the drama that has been enacted in American society around punishment. A massive mobilization of resources has been undertaken, attended by the corralling and physical control over the bodies of a large non-white population and population. The political rhetoric around it is protect our children, keep ourselves safe from, well, from the scum or the rabble. These are terms that come to mind. Keep us safe from the element that threatens our civilization. You don't have to be a social philosopher like Jürgen Habermas to see that something really profound is being enacted in such a society. This is not just policy. Policies signify and the racially disparate incidents of a massively punitive mobilization like the war on drugs signifies massively. In doing so, it both engenders and draws upon a wealth of social meanings that are harmful to the developmental prospects of black people. But here's what I really want to say about the war on drugs. Everybody does drugs, excepting this audience, of course. The data on drug consumption in America, admissions to hospital emergency rooms for drug overdoses, treatment facility enrollments, recent reporting about the much touted opioid epidemic, all of that data reveal that all classes, races, and regions are in the game. Drugs are a massive consumer market involving everybody, everybody. Small wonder that such a black commerce would disproportionately enlist in its employ those at the margins of society. That can be no surprise. So, too, 
with the violence that attends the traffic in drugs. If one cannot write an enforceable contract, one is in a state of nature and disputes will be resolved through violence. That has been the truth of the world since the dawn of time. So it is that there is violent trafficking in drugs in inner city communities in the United States which are heavily black. And so it is that the persons participating in that commerce have come to be incarcerated. I make no excuses for them. But there can be no doubt that institutional structures involving people of all races and classes, complicated structures, and a massive discretionary utilization of punitive resources have worked to promote a racially disparate incidence of incarceration. One result of corralling so many black bodies has been the symbolic degradation of black people, thereby fostering an interpretative pose that ends up absolving larger society of any responsibility to consider reforms, a superstructure of ideas, an ideology, reinforces and legitimates the status quo, removing any ethical doubts that might be lingering about who is to blame for this mess. Here again, we can see how questions about them necessarily entail critical questions about us. To this point, I've been talking about which positive causal model is best suited to account for persistent racial disparities. I would like to close this lecture with an explicitly normative argument as follows. How any society answers the question, who are we, is very significant. It is certainly an important question in the United States today. Who are we? Whose country is it? when talking about crime, violence, school failure, urban decay, prisons, poverty, et cetera, are these matters in the back of our minds that can be understood as us and them? Because if it's us and them, anything is possible. It becomes possible to say about those people languishing in our prisons and in our ghettos and in our hospital emergency rooms, and in our welfare and unemployment lines, it becomes possible to say about these people in our great cities, that's not my country, that's some kind of third world thing. But that's a lie. Black people are not aliens in America. We are as American as you can get, as American as anybody can be. All of these problems of poverty, violence, school failure, broken families, these thoroughly American affairs. They are not simply measures of the inadequacy of black culture. They reflect our social inadequacies, I wish to argue, all of us. I buttress that argument by observing the incompleteness of human capital, insisting that human developmental processes are socially contextualized, and stressing that race plays an elemental part in all of this. That is what I mean when I, as an economist, nevertheless insist on placing relations before transactions. Thinking in this way helps to account for the durable racial inequality with which America is still encumbered. Consider the poor central city dwellers who make up a sizable minority of the black American population. My controversial claim has been that some behavioral patterns in that population are a big part of the so urging greater personal responsibility in these quarters is, in my view, both necessary and proper. But I am not a moral infant. That can hardly be the end of the story. Any morally astute response to the social pathology of American history's losers will conclude that while we cannot change our ignoble past, we need not and must not be indifferent to the contemporary consequences that issue directly from that past for which we bear collective responsibility. I can put this conclusion more pointedly. The self-limiting patterns of behavior amongst poor blacks in the central cities of America are not a product of an alien cultural imposition upon an otherwise pristine canvas. Rather, this allegedly pathological behavior of these most marginal Americans is deeply rooted in my country's history. It has evolved in tandem with our political and economic institutions and with the cultural practices that support 
and legitimate those institutions, practices that have been deeply biased against black people. While we must not ignore the behavioral problems of this so-called underclass, we should discuss and react to them as if we were talking about our own children, about our neighbors and our friends. It's an American tragedy. It is a national and not merely a communal disgrace. We should respond to it as we might to an epidemic of teen suicide by embracing, not demonizing, the perpetrators who often enough are also the victims. Doing so would fully vindicate the intuition of that young black economist mentioned in my opening dialogue by placing relations before transactions when accounting for persistent racial disparity in America. It would complete the civic revolution that was the goal of the civil rights movement to free us Americans who descend from slaves from the burden of racial domination. But there's more to this story. For freedom is one thing, and equality quite another. The former is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the latter. The civic and the communal arenas are complements, not substitutes. It is futile and dangerous for us black Americans to rely on others to shoulder our communal responsibilities. If we want to walk with dignity, to enjoy truly equal standing with my diverse, prosperous, and dynamic society, the United States of America, then we blacks must accept the fact that white America, white America can never give us what we seek in response to our protest and remonstrations. Rather, we must make ourselves equal by dint of our own effort. We must earn it. I take no pleasure in doing so, but I am obliged in closing to report this reality. Equality of dignity, of standing, of honor, of security in our position, of an equal ability to command the respect of others, these things cannot simply be handed over. They will not be the fruit of insurrection, uprising, or rebellion. This kind of equality is something we black Americans must wrestle with our bare hands from a cruel and indifferent world by means of our own effort, inspired by the example of our freedom fighting ancestors, we must make ourselves equal. No one can do that for us. Until we black Americans recognize and accept the unlovely but inexorable fact about the human condition, until we eschew the victimization posture and embrace the existential imperatives of our freedom, until we redress the self-destructive behavior patterns that plague our communities, until then, the racial disparities that so trouble America's politics and that so threaten, so threaten its domestic tranquility will continue to persist. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's so, a lot of ideas there, uh, and uh, it's time to turn to the audience who may have reflections, uh, comments, questions. I ask you to keep them brief, to say who you are before you, you, uh, you um, uh, take the microphone. It will, will come to you from one side or the other. Uh, I'll try and hand it with those in the upper part of the lecture theater and those below. So who would, who would like to go first? And I'm going to take questions in, in blocks of three. Uh, and then uh, turn it back to Glenn. So, is there anyone who would like to uh, like to start? There we are. A question. At the Hi, um, my name is Mary Starks. I'm an alumnus of, of the LSE. Um, I, I mean, I studied economics here a long time ago. Now, and economics is a very transactional discipline, and it's quite it's pretty good at exploring um, the allocation of 
that is in by market mechanisms. But I just wondered how useful a discipline you had found it for exploring relational issues and also the allocation of um, de developmental resources, I think was your, your term. Uh, or to put it another way, if you were a teenager and you were interested in the question on the board behind you, should you sign up for economics or would you be better off studying history or um, politics or something, sociology? Thank you. So, question down in the middle there. So, if the microphone could just travel a little bit along the row, please. Uh, my name is Delbert Sandiford. Uh, just reflecting on what was said, I used to be a student here about 50 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> quite ancient. I was struck by what you said about the relational aspect, the developmental bias, and the fact that that's not subject to uh, market clearing mechanisms. You mentioned, as an example, uh, race and marriage and the family. And I was struck by that too, because I guess there's no interracial issue marriage. How is that going to work? As a subset of all that, if you went down that route uh, of interracial marriage, you could find that in two or three generations, there are no black people left because of intermarriage. Or no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more before I come back to Glenn. If not, I can I, yeah, question down there, uh, and we'll, we'll come to you in a moment. Yeah, just on the side down. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel Song. I'm an A-level student, and uh, my question is, do you think the persistence of uh, racial diasporas have a overall positive or negative impact on race relations? I, I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Whether racial diasporas have. Diasporas. Yeah, that was the question on diasporas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Glenn, back, back to you. Uh, good question, Glenn. Uh, well, I'm an economist. I'm going to say that everyone should st study economics. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say economists should read sociology and history. That's, that's what I think needs to happen. Um, I do admit to a bit of chauvinism, plenarily speaking here. Um, I think the rigor of the methods, I think the clarity of the formal exposition and whatnot uh, uh, is to economics credit. There's a reason why we're the queen of the social sciences. But I think narrow, uh, narrowness is a, a pitfall uh, in, in my neck of the intellectual academic woods. I uh, can tell you time and time again, sitting in my department at Brown University, feeling like I don't have anybody to talk to. You know, a great book has just dropped, some amazing essay has been written, and I go to knock on my colleagues' doors. There are no books on the shelves, uh, and they, you know, they want to talk about what's in the journal in the last five years. This fellow accepted, of course. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that. Uh, the, uh, I said I called myself a neoliberal. I know that that's a uh, uh, allegation in some quarters. Um, I think the insights from economics uh, in, into all aspects of human behavior can be really quite profound. Uh, and uh, there's an elegance and a, and, a, and a clarity of thought. But unadulterated economics, uh, that's, that's a problem. Uh, I'm not going there, as you could see from this talk. Uh, on the marriage market uh, question, here's what I'm getting at, okay? Men and women bargain over sexual exchange. Uh, this is gonna be an anthropologist observation now. The bargaining process is conditioned by the outside outcomes of the respective parties. To the extent that women have more options for their favors, the men with whom they bargain will be nicer, more disciplined, more faithful, more reliable, more contributors to the welfare of their children. So it's a theoretical point that I'm making. I'm not advocating for anything. I'm just saying, you see black men and black women interacting with each other, and they don't marry, and they have children, and there's all kinds of uh, problems. In America, I, I don't know the situation in the UK at all well. And the inclination is to say from the outside, well, you see, there's something called black culture, and it's the re reflected in these patterns of behavior. And yet, hypothetically, 
were the behavior of white people and black people with respect to each other to be different, the behavior of black people with respect to black people would be different on the argument, the economics argument that I'm making here about bargaining and uh, exchange within um, uh, male-female uh, uh, relationships. And therefore, it's a theoretical point, I'm not advocating anything, and therefore, the causal account that says there's something exogenous to the system called black culture, which has produced the outcome, patterns of uh, broken marriage and broken homes, uh, is, is uh, er erroneous. It missed something really important. It wasn't exogenous. The pattern of interaction between the men and women was an equilibrium product of a systemic phenomenon which involved people who are not black. That, that's what I was saying. Um, but you're certainly right to say that intermarriage, again, I wasn't advocating it, but it might not be the worst thing, would have the consequence in the fullness of time of changing the identity matrix of changing the way in which people thought about themselves. We're seeing this happen. I mean, I can't help but note that the first black president of the United States has a white mother. And the first black vice president of the United States has an Indian mother. They're black. But, you know, let a couple of three generations go by and the uh, fidelity with which we could categorically allocate people to this or that uh, racial group will be, uh, will be undermined. Things will become more ambiguous. Again, I'm not advocating for it. On the other hand, uh, look at the ethnic composition of the United States. With the exception of Jews, and there's much concern among Jews about intermarriage, the Irish, the Italians, the Slavs, for the thickness of those identities in the earlier period of American history when those immigration flows were large has diminished and diminished over time under the pressures of intermarriage and whatnot. They wear their identities less heavily. They can take off that jacket and something else. Um, and that well may be the future of race um, in America too, um, I don't know. Uh, diaspora. Uh, I'm not sure what to say here because I'm not sure I, under, I understand what the question is. Uh, whether or not African Americans who are themselves the descendant of immigrant families who have come into the country are in some different position from African Americans who descend from American slaves or is something, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the question is, so I'd ask for clarification. So my question was more focused on how uh, in multicultural countries like the US, um, migrants of a certain race tend to uh, concentrate in one area rather than be spread out um, uh, by race in by various race, races. So uh, do you think that is preventing, uh, do you think that's preventing social co cohesion? Okay, um, uh, I'm, I'm at somewhat of a loss. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I still don't really understand the question. I, I apologize. I, I apologize. Okay. Concentration. Um, we'll move on. We'll move on. Okay, another round of questions. questions. Yeah. Um, Nava, did you? No, I'm sorry. Uh, one here. So one here, one there, and one there. And then we'll go, and then I'll come up. Hi, thank you. I'm Charlotte Harris. I'm just a visitor. Um, I think this is linked to the question on diaspora, and I think you've also partly answered, addressed it. But one of the most striking features of American culture or society from an outsider's perspective is the emphasis that the non-black population places on its ancestral roots. So people talking about being Chinese American, uh, German American, Irish American, Italian American. Um, Obviously, for the majority of the black population, because of the slavery history, they're kind of cut off yeah. from that. And I suppose my question is, what, 
how, how much, if any, impact do you think that has on the continuation and perpetuation of race in America and racial inequality? Okay, we'll take okay. this one, one over the back there, yeah. Good evening. Um, my name is Carmen Plever. I'm a hospital doctor and a lawyer and um, an immigrant myself into Britain 38 years ago. Um, when you talk about the, at the end you spoke about the, the solutions, I quote you saying equality and dignity, security, etc. not just be handed over to us as black Americans and we must stop the self-destructive behavior. Um, how do you see them doing that when the institutionalized racism is so stacked against black Americans, whether you take the American justice system, criminal justice system in America, or American educational system, or policing, etc., is so stacked against people who are poor, um, neglected, um, as you yourself spoke about, how in the so-called drugs in all documentaries that you see about it it is a war on black male drug users while you s you say yourself it's a it's an american problem on the whole so how then do you see them coming out of that thank okay. you there was one more question i think somewhere along that hi my name is yu xiao hu and i'm a phd student here i think the idea of placing relations before transactions is very elegant. And I want to um, ask for the relation, do you mean within black with race relation or black white relation? Because if we talk about black and white relations, then a lack of those social capital might be a reason why black people can't move to a senior position. But if we talk about within black relation, then probably a very strong social capital is the reason why violence is um, why violence or crime is so dominant in the black uh, in the black region and the second question is we have also observed a salient geographical racial segregation in the United States so do you think uh, it's a good policy for example the moving to opportunity project will be a good thing to remove um, or to eliminate racial inequality and to boost, for example, social capital between white and black people. Thank you. I do think Move to Opportunity is a good idea. This is a program, a policy program in the United States to subsidize low-income people to be able to move out of areas of concentrated poverty. Many of these areas are racially concentrated. By the way, in the evaluation of Move to Opportunity, people do move from poor areas to less poor areas. But they don't move from black areas to white areas. They move from black areas to other areas that might not be quite as black, but that are still an improvement in the, in the um, opportunities that they are able to generate from their neighborhood location. I do think move to opportunity is, is a good thing. I see the argument, uh, the argument that some people will make. Well, you disband the community. And in fact, the strength of the community was going to come from people keeping people in close proximity to one another, people who have shared understanding, common identity, uh, solidarity, and so forth. Um, and uh, I think the burden is on those who make such arguments to sh demonstrate empirically the benefits for uh, prosperity and status attainment and whatnot of uh, the supposed racial solidarity that uh, concentrated neighborhoods or segregated schools are, are, are uh, alleged to impart. This is not an argument for or against segregation. It's simply an argument that um, I don't think uh, the maintenance of uh, racial connectivity for its own sake um, is a, a particularly compelling, uh, compelling uh, program. It's not a project that I would embrace. I called myself a man of the West. I hope you noticed that uh, here. I mean, uh, the identities are not just racial. Our identities are many things. I mean, they are cultural and they are uh, uh, normative and whatnot, and those aspects that transcend race. The society is quite dynamic in the United States, as I'm sure it is, is the case here. So uh, an effort to hold on, to hold on to the status quo ante that we've uh, inherited from the past may not be the wisest course. Um, 
I take the point, the experience of African Americans, and I don't know if this was your point or not, who descend from enslaved persons who were kidnapped and brought against their will into the country um, is different from the experience of an uh, ethnic group that has an uh, ancestry that it traced back uh, perhaps even hundreds of years from the motherland or the homeland who come and reassemble themselves as an ethnic enclave within the United States. I can recall an essay by the great uh, historical sociologist of Jamaica and a black Jamaican named Orlando Patterson, Harvard, uh, toward a future that has no past was his argument uh, about the conditions of uh, people who descend from slaves. He's a Jamaican and he had in mind Jamaican society, but it's also true of blacks in the United States of America where the fact of slavery, the cauldron, the holocaust, if you will, of slavery obliterates linguistic and cultural distinctions that had been flourishing amongst the various African populations that the slave traders drew on and puts people all together cheek by jowl now in a new terrible, terrible, uh, uh, awful uh, circumstance. And out of that develops a culture uh, and, and an identity that is unique, that is nothing brought from the old country, but something created right here. I mean, we black Americans, if you will, are nothing Americans. We're not Africans, I would say. We are Americans. Our history is to be found in the 1830s and 1840s and the 1850s in those slave quarters of the plantations and the spirituals that the Negroes sang in order to comfort themselves in their uh, travails and so forth and so on. We are Americans. The writer, the late Albert Murray, has a book called Omni-Americans in which he argues that we're, we're in some sense er-Americans. This is accepting the native population that was decimated. We, we are the raw elements of the creation of American culture. I mean, look at the musical and cultural influences of African Americans and so on. So there is that. Um, I got to address the question from the lady in the corner over there. Madam, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm with you, and it's true uh, that uh, the burdens of the uh, racial stigma that I was trying to outline have been severe. Uh, I'm with you, and it's indisputable that the challenge that I put to my people, if you will, um, are foreboding, forbidding, I should say. Um, but here's what I would say in response to your question. Nobody is coming to save us. We really don't have a choice but to take up the burden that I, uh, that I described. Um, let me talk about violence, about homicide about 20,000 a year now in the United States of America, half of those are blacks, about what's going on in my town of Chicago, about violence, about murder. Now, you say, how can they do it? Well, the they here are people who mounted a movement with help that transformed American politics in the middle of the 20th century and created an entirely new dispensation for black people. The they are the people who descend from a population, I'm talking now about the freed slaves, the freedmen, 1870, 1880, 1890, concentrated in the south of the United States. They were largely illiterate, landless peasants. Within a half century, they had, uh, acquired a rate of literacy that was comparable to other uh, uh, advanced countries and had uh, begun to develop uh, their own, because of Jim Crow segregation and their exclusion from white institutions, their own institutions of education, they had acquired land, they had et cetera, et cetera. This population, my people, are capable of seizing the reins of their own destiny. That's all I'm advocating. I'm saying don't sit back with our hands out in a plea, waiting for someone else to care as much about our children as we should do because they won't care about our children as we are capable of doing. 
That's what I'm advocating. It's at the end of my talk because I didn't want it to be the main point, but it's there because I didn't want it to be an overlooked point. There is freedom and equality. That's what the distinction I'm making. There is freedom. That's a civic question. That's about law, non-discrimination, inclusion, and the rest. And then there's equality. The distinction that I'm making, I think, is absolutely fundamental because the ultimate achievement of equal status has to be earned. That's my axiom. You can ask, don't you see, even in the asking and the giving, you've made yourself unequal. You've made the person who is in the position of saying yes or no to the request the arbiter of your fate. You've endowed that person with the magnanimity to be able to respond positively to your plea. That's not equality. I want equality for my people. OK, so we have probably around for one more. There's, there's a couple at the top there, and then I'll come down the front. OK. Hi, my name is Anaya Flaren. I'm, an, I'm a journalist. Thank you for the lecture. Really fascinating. Just continuing on that question that the lady um, asked, I mean, why do you think that the arguments that you're putting forward has seemingly, at least within mainstream or dominant culture, lost so much ground? I mean, on the kind of dominant view, one that's being rapidly institutionalized, is the argument for institutions actively forwarding a quality of outcome and uh, wider society putting forward policies that don't necessarily assume the kind of agency and capacity of African-American to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. It's very much a kind of helping hand approach. So why do you, why do you think that your arguments seemingly have lost so much ground over the last few decades? OK, we'll go at the back there, then I'm going to come down to the, to the front. OK, thank you. Hi, great thanks for the talk. I'm Jasper. I'm a keen follower of bloggingheads.tv podcast I'd recommend to my friends. Um, my question is about um, kind of following on from what Inaya was saying. Um, is there scope for institutional solutions to this kind of problem? Because the advice that you seem to be suggesting is very individual and seems very powerful, but it seems also hard to enact in a scale. Um, like, for example, if me myself wants to make a change, I don't know what I would be able to do. Um, but an institution it almost seems like a shortcut to reach certain outcomes. Do you think there's scope for that or not? OK, so there's lots of questions at the front. I'm not going to have time to, to go all of you. I'll come, come here, and we'll do a quick two or three there, and then I'll come back to Glenn. If there's another chance, we'll go around, OK? So just, yeah, pass, pass it along. Um, we're going to have three in a row, and they're all going to be brief. So yeah, just pass your neighbor, and then we'll, we'll work down there. OK. Um, my name is Tom Oralade, um, and I'm a journalist. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of social capital and how that relates to um, um, African immigrants to America, so not, not the descendants of slaves, but African immigrants, um, because with um, social capital um, in, in relation to those African immigrants, um, it's not clear to me that the social capital that they have is in any way different from the social capital of of African Americans, um, they tend to um, interact mostly with African Americans. Nevertheless, um, when you look at the um, children of African immigrants, they tend to do extremely well in, term in terms of education and employment, and also um, th th they're less um, likely to be involved in the justice system. So, how, how do you reconcile that? Okay, so pass to yeah. Um, hi, my name is Jane, and um, I'm an A-level student. Um, and my question is a bit idealistic, I guess. But um, how, w how would you describe um, an ideal world where racial inequality no longer persists? And what are the processes that we would have have to have gone through in order to get to that point? Describe a what? A world where, where racial inequality Oh, how would I describe it? So we'll go one, one here, and then. We'll come back to Glenn, and if we have enough time, we will go for one more round. Um, hi, Glenn. My name is Rene Anjay. Um, I'm an alumnus at this university, um, and I'm a big admirer of yours as well. Seconded with the uh, Blogging Heads uh, promotion earlier on. Um, uh, really, really gr uh, great, great stuff. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, systemic racism. Um, so that's a term, obviously, that's been used. We've obviously from from you guys in America. Um, 
your, I know from your own intellectual journey that you earlier on, or at least in the two, early 2000s, you were quite um, sympathetic to that narrative or more sympathetic um, than you had been in, your, um, in the 90s. Um, what do you take on it now? And how does your analysis, um, the analysis that you have work with uh, that current understanding of systemic, well, with the current understanding of systemic racism, and are we making a mistake when we use the term, do we need to be more clear when we use the term? Do, we th do, you, do you think that people are doing it wrong? Do you think that's counterproductive? I think I know your answer, but I just thought <laughs> if you can give it to us in, in, a, in a, yeah, thank <laughs> you. Okay, Glenn, back to you. Okay, that's a, that's a massive agenda. Why, have, uh, the why has the position that I've been taking lost ground in the last years? Was that, was that the question? Uh, I don't think it has, actually. Um, I think the jury is out. Um, this is an old argument, the argument that I, uh, the part of the argument that I made that everyone seems to want to focus on, that last part of the argument where I distinguish between civic and communal, and I distinguish between freedom and equality, and I put the onus on black people to seize the reins and to determine our own destiny and so forth and so on. I admit that that's rhetoric. That's not a political program. I, I admit that. That's auditory. I use the word in its literal meaning. I don't, I don't cast any aspersions in doing so. That's calling to arms. That, that's an idealistic invocation about a spiritual challenge, an existential challenge. I don't mean religious. Uh, I mean being able to stand up straight with dignity, with one's held, held, head held high. And the balled up fist, the anger, the, the, the smash, the smash, it's a natural impulse and it's very gratifying. Under certain conditions, it's also necessary. We no longer live under those conditions in the United States of America. An empirical claim, I invite you to debate me about whether or not that's the case. This is not Jim Crow. This, this is not lynching. This is not no blacks need apply. Every major cultural institution in the country is behind the woke agenda. People who run the universities, the people who run the uh, uh, human resource departments of corporate America, the people who make the movies, the people who give out the foundation grants and so forth, the journalists, they're all square behind the anti-racism agenda. And still, the tragic loss of human potential that motivated me and give this uh, lecture is playing itself out. And all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that we black people have the potential to shape the future of our children and I call us to that task. That's not a political program. I have no idea whether or not it will be more popular in five years or 10 years. It just happens to be, in my humble opinion, correct. So. I'm not a politician. Maybe I'm also not a prophet, but maybe I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, individuals can only do so much and institutions matter. I, I, I grant you that. Um, there is interaction between the two. So, you know, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for equality. Institutions have to be made open and fair before individuals can have the, the scope to realize what their efforts can, can produce. Uh, I think these things go hand in hand uh, with one another. I mean, universities should be diverse, I agree. They should make an effort to find underrepresented minorities and admit them in their number. I agree. The students have to also seize the reins of the opportunity and make the best of it in developing their human potential. That requires hard work and effort. Now I'm going to do something right now that I warned against in my talk. I'm going to say, look at the Asians in the United States of America who are in court suing Harvard University and the University of North Carolina for discrimination against them, barriers to keep them out by uh, various devices of one kind or another. They come in with high test scores, et cetera. Not taking a position in the legislation here. I'm just saying, how much better to be in the position of knocking the thing down and having them have to build barriers to keep you out than to be in the position 
of woe is me, woe is me. We need to get rid of the SAT. We need a special dispensation in order to include our people. How pathetic, ultimately, is the argument, we will bring diversity to your ranks. That's why we should be here. Not excellence, diversity. I'm selling my identity, my black face, my black culture. I'll add some color to the mix. So I want equality for my people. I'm repeating myself here a little bit, I know, but uh, the individual versus institutional, let's get the institutional right. Let's get systemic racism under control. New Orleans is a city susceptible to flood. Poor people live on the low-lying areas that flood first. Wealthy people live up at higher elevation. Most of the people in the low-lying areas are black and they're poor. When the levee breaks and the water comes in, they drown. Read COVID. This is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the fact that people, when positioned in certain vulnerable places within the structure, who are disproportionately of color because of history, they're susceptible. The unemployment rate ticks up. Who's going to be the first one to be laid off and so forth? The schools don't work. Well, the people with options who can afford to move to better neighborhoods or avail themselves of private educational services don't suffer to the same degree. Of course there is systemic racism of the sort that I'm describing, which is to say structural factors that interact with historical processes so as to disproportionately burden people of color. Some of those are susceptible to change by policy. Frankly, I think educational service delivery should be open to more competitive uh, education providers, charter schools and so forth in the big cities in order to give families that don't have the money to move out some options. That's very controversial, I know, but that's an institutional modification. But there still remains the burdens on individuals. Please don't ask me to not talk about individual responsibility because it somehow takes away from the force of a, a political argument that one wants to make. We can do both things at the same time. We must do both things at the same time. Maybe the place to have that, have that conversation is not in a political campaign for the presidency of the United States. Maybe the place to have that conversation is in a lecture hall or a church basement or a communal group or something of that sort. But it seems to me that we, we can have both kinds of conversations. Can I envision a world in which racial inequality doesn't exist? No, frankly, I can't. Here's my argument. I, I actually think that perfect proportional representation is, is a false god. I, I, it's a mistake to even make that to be a public goal. By equality, I don't necessarily mean an equal representation of every racial group in every pursuit. I just think there's a contradiction in that. We have groups, and the groups are different. Uh, the question about African immigrants in the United States and their social capital, they are coming with different cultures and different expectations and different family organization, different ideals, et cetera. Um, parents will lament the extent to which their children are Americanized and start to think of themselves as black Americans and not as Nigerians because you know, they fear that that cultural inheritance of a keen edge to uh, educational attainment and uh, business uh, entrepreneurship and so forth will be dulled by the blending in with the, with the cu cultures are different. Peoples are different. Uh, you can't expect them all to manifest excellence in every area of human activity to the same degree. Um, 